we want to continue our study of evangelism. Uh, last week, we started by talking about the priority of evangelism, why evangelism is one of the, should be one of the highest priorities in our lives and as a church. Talked about why that's so, because Christ, first of all, was an evangelist. Uh, he, you see in the beginning of Matthew there, he, he launches his ministry preaching the gospel of repentance. And not only uh, is, must evangelism be high priority in our life because it was also a priority in his life, but also because he commanded us to make disciples of all nations, to preach the gospel to every creature. And so it, it should be a high priority because we're commanded to uh, proclaim the gospel of Christ. And then lastly, we looked at Romans chapter 1, where Paul talks about how the gospel is the power of God into salvation. And that when we proclaim the gospel, we're really proclaiming the righteousness of God. We're, we're, we're proclaiming the glories of Christ. And so if that doesn't provide uh, reason enough why it should be a high priority in my life, then we, then we have a serious problem. We have a lot of things out of order. And so uh, we, we're to be living lives uh, as evangelists, making Christ known to those around us, uh, because what else... Uh, what's the one thing we can't do in heaven? You know, we can worship God in heaven, we can eat, we can sing, fellowship, but we can't preach the gospel to the lost. And so we want to take every opportunity we can to bring Christ to those around us. Well, last night we talked about the priority of evangelism. Tonight I'd like to talk about the purpose of evangelism. And so we're, uh, my wife asked me, well, when, we're, when, when are you going to talk about, or when are we going to talk about like the, the how-tos of evangelism? And... We're going to get there, but I told her first I want to talk about some of the theological aspects of, of evangelism and the gospel. So we'll probably spend a few weeks talking about some of the theological uh, thing, biblical things that we should understand. And then we'll start talking about some of the ways we practice uh, evangelism, the way we do evangelism. But tonight I'd like to talk about uh, the purpose of evangelism. And I'd like to begin that by saying, first of all, what evangelism is not, and then talk about what evangelism is see what evangelism is, it really provides for us the purpose of why we do evangelism, beyond some of the things we looked at last week. So, first of all, if we think about what evangelism is not, you know, I could probably come up with you know, 10 or 20 different things, but I, I just wrote down five for tonight. Now, the first thing evangelism is not, it is not something that we do primarily in this building. I think a lot of times uh, when people think of evangelism, they think of, you know, I'm going to invite the person to church. And that's a wonderful thing, and we want to invite people to church. But I grew up in churches where we would have a, uh, I grew up in fundamental independent Baptist churches where every year we would have an evangelist come, we would have a revival week, and he would come in and, and we were to invite all our friends and neighbors and relatives to come and hear the gospel. And they would hear the, the gospel when this evangelist would come and bring, the, bring a powerful, powerful messages. And those were good things. That's, that's not a bad thing. But I think for a lot of people, that's like the one time in the year where they're like doing evangelism. You know, you invite somebody to church because we got an evangelist coming. But when we look at scripture, that's not really, that's not what evangelism is. In fact, that's not even really what an evangelist is. Uh, evangelism is not inviting somebody to church so the preacher can evangelize them or so the evangelist can evangelize them. Again, we, we want to invite people to church. We want them to hear the evangelist. We want them to hear the preacher. But when we think of evangelism, and, and we can even think of it personally because as we talked about last week, you know, we can't say, well, I don't have the gift of evangelism because we're all called to, be, to evangelize. And so whether you have the gift of evangelism or not doesn't mean... Well, if you don't have the gift of evangelism, that doesn't mean you don't evangelize any more than if you don't have the gift of giving, you don't give to the offering, right? So, uh, and we could go through all the spiritual gifts and say, well, I don't have the gift of teaching or I don't have the gift of serving, so I'm not going to serve. No, we don't think that way. And so we should think that way either about evangelism. Evangelism is something that God wants all of us to be doing. But when you look at how the, they evangelize in the early church, when you look at the evangelism <coughs> of the early church, they, they didn't go into churches to preach the gospel to people in churches. 
when you look at evangelists in scripture, they went to where the non-believers were. And when you think of Paul, when he went into a, a town where there were Jews, when he wanted to reach the Jews, where did Paul go? The very first place he always went. He went to the synagogue. Didn't matter if he was in Asia Minor, which was, uh, the, you know, was outside of Israel, was where it was predominantly Gentiles. He always began in the synagogue. Remember last week we talked about the power, the gospel's power of God to salvation to the Jew first and also to the, to the Greek. Paul always went to the synagogue and he would engage in discussion and, and teaching and debates with the Jews. He would present Christ as the long-awaited and resurrected Messiah. So he went to where the unbelievers were. And then, when he wanted to target the Gentiles, where did he go to engage the Gentiles with the gospel? Well, he went to the Agora, which uh, English translation would be the marketplace. And he would engage in discussion because the Greeks, the Gentiles, loved to debate. They, they loved philosophy and to, and to talk about wisdom. And, and so he would go to the marketplace where the Gentiles would gather and they, were, they would have philosophical discussions. He went to where the non-believers were. And then when you look at Philip the Evangelist in Acts chapter 8, where was he? He was among the Samaritans. Again, non-believers. He was preaching the gospel to the Samaritans. And then the Holy Spirit sent him down south on the desert road where he came into contact with the Ethiopian eunuch. So he, the Lord sent the evangelist out amongst the unbelievers. The evangelist went out on their turf, on the turf of the unbelievers. He went into their synagogues and their marketplaces and in their neighborhoods. And so when we think of evangelism, we shouldn't think of evangelism as being primarily, and I emphasize the word primarily, in this building. I remember when I was in seminary, my preaching professor, he, he told us, you guys, when you pastor a church, when you move somewhere, don't look for Christian barbers and Christian mechanics and Christian lawn care people. You know, go to an, an, an unbelieving barber. So you can be a witness, so you can be a testimony, so you can share Christ and build a relationship with that person and, lead, and invite them to church or lead them to Christ in the barbershop. And so it's not that we shouldn't have, that we shouldn't have believers that or do some of those things, but we shouldn't exclusively live in a Christian bubble. I remember I was in Czech Republic one time and this pastor, he told the, pastor, the missionary friend that we, I was working with, that he didn't know of one unbeliever with whom to share the gospel. It's like, well, how, how do you reach your city if you don't have any interaction or you don't know any unbelievers? And so we need to put ourselves in position to meet unbelievers because evangelism is done primarily outside of this church. Yes, we invite people here for evangelistic events and things, but we don't want to just rely upon that to reach this city because the majority of the people in the city are not going to come to this location. We have to go to their location. When you look at evangelists in the uh, New Testament, they were um, they were basically church planners and missionaries. So uh, we have to think outward when we think of evangelism. Secondly, evangelism is not merely not only is it not primarily in this location, but it's not merely about your experience. Because a lot of times when we think about evangelism, we think, well, I'm going to share my testimony with somebody. And God wants us to share our testimony with people. In fact, he commands us to, uh, in Acts chapter 1 he told Christ told his disciples right before the ascension, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And so we are to testify. We are to give testimony of, what, of who Christ is, and what Christ has done. We're to give testimony as to who as to the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so, but when we, when we give our testimony, it's not primarily about our experience. Yes, we want to share how Christ changed our life, but it's not primarily about us. Uh, because people have all kinds of experiences. I remember one time I was preaching on a Sunday morning and the lady stood up over here and she goes, I met Jesus on the train on the way here this morning. She said she physically met Christ in the train. Uh, I don't even remember what I said. I mean, what do you say to somebody who says that well, while you're preaching? <laughs> and somebody, and a lot of people, they tell you they have these experiences and they equate that with their salvation. And so 
But when we share our testimony, we don't want our, our focus isn't to, to wow them with with our lives, but is to is to wow them with Jesus Christ. And I remember I had a professor, another professor in the center, he was a missionary in Bangladesh, he translated the Bible into the Bengali language. And I remember he was talking about evangelism one day in a Hebrew class. He said, Men, he says, when you share your testimony, don't make it about you. Make it about Christ and fill your testimony with Scripture. Because the Word of God is the power of God to salvation. It contains the power of God. It's sharper, it's living and sharper than any two-edged sword. And so <coughs> when we share our testimony, we do share what God has done in our life, our wretched sinner, but for all of what Christ has done for us and, and who Christ is. And so we include Scripture in that because it's not merely about us. It's about Jesus Christ. And we give praise and testimony for what he has done in our life. So our goal when we finish our testimony is not to wow people with our experience, but to wow them with the person and work of Christ. So evangelism is not merely about your experience. So I am sorry to merely about your experience. Thirdly, evangelism is not mere social work. A lot of people, they do a lot of social work. They feed the hungry, care for orphans, minister to the sick, and all those are necessary and wonderful things. Uh, but in and of themselves, that's not evangelism. I remember when we came to our last church 13 years ago, we came to this church, and a friend of mine, he had been serving in this church for a few years, he moved from another town, and he started this social work. And he had an afternoon social program every afternoon for a couple hours, and he largely targeted gypsies. And we had mostly gypsies that would come, which is good because they're a very difficult group of people to, to reach in Europe. And he went out, he, this guy was a mover and shaker, he could make things happen. He went out and he raised tens of thousands of dollars. But you know where he got it from? He got it from the government. He got money from the city government, from the European Union to fund this social work because you're keeping these problem kids off the streets. They're out stealing and creating problems. And so they, they thought this is a good thing to try to, to reach these kids. And so the pastor that I ended up co-pastoring with the last 12 or so years, he, he got there a year before me. Well, this guy dumped this ministry into his lap. Well, actually, I shouldn't say ministry. He dumped this social work into his lap. The problem was he had five years left on a contract with the European Union and the local city government that he had to maintain this social work for five years. Otherwise, they have to pay back the money, which would have been tens of thousands of dollars of the church of 20 people. We got there and the church was 20 people. And the problem was is you could not share the gospel. You could only, you could only share the gospel if they asked you. So he did all this work, raised all this money, spent all this time every afternoon for several hours and had to staff it with people and everything in hopes that somebody would ask you about the gospel. And my problem was is he, he confused doing social work, you know, helping people or trying to encourage people with evangelism. Evangelism only takes place when the gospel is proclaimed. Otherwise, you're just helping people. You're being nice to people. You may be actually meeting needs in their lives, but apart from the gospel, we're not helping them eternally. We're only helping them temporarily. I have friends in Africa who tell me about missions teams that go to Africa, and they hold babies at orphanages, and they do all kinds of wonderful things, bringing food and clothing and things. But he says, unfortunately, much of it goes without gospel proclamation. So we need to remember that evangelism is not doing good deeds for people apart from gospel proclamation. Evangelism always is about gospel proclamation. So if we do those things, we want to include the gospel. That makes it evangelism. Fourthly, evangelism is not measured or defined by results. Now, a lot of people, a lot of times people, um, they look at it as like, well, we did evangelism if people responded or People raised their hand or they got saved. Uh, and, you know, I grew up, like I said, in independent fundamental churches. And we always had altar calls after the service. And I remember I was, before I actually came to this church, it looked like we were going to go to Northern Virginia. 
talking to a church, and every time we finish the Skype meeting or Zoom meeting with these people, me and Sandy are like, man, it looks like that's where we're going to go. And the last conversation I had was the pastor wanted to know about give, me giving altar calls. And I said, look, I always give an invitation when you want people to respond to the gospel, to come forward if they have a need. But I said, I can't stand there and say, you know, we're going to sing one more verse of just as I am. And we've all, we've all been in these before. And I've heard, I've, been, I've witnessed thousands of altar calls. I myself have gone down the aisle many times to pray at the altar. Uh, even though there's really not an altar there, we never sacrificed any animals there. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, we had what we called an altar call. And I have no problem with people coming down the aisle. I have no problem for people coming for prayer or for the gospel. We want that. If people want to come down our aisles for prayer, to pray, to receive Christ. That's absolutely what we want people to do. But I've been, in, I've been around ministries where they measure their evangelism or their effectiveness by how many people, people respond, how many decisions, or how many hands went up, or how many people, young people stood up at a fire. It's funny, over in Europe, there's this one organization, and they would always have their evangelistic message in front of a bonfire, a big fire. You know, you preach hellfire and brimstone, and you get them to stand up if they they're going to be saved. But a lot of times these young people, you know, they're emotionally influenced and they can experience, you know, a lot of that is manipulation. And so, and then I would get their newsletters. They would write back to America and say, you know, 20 kids got saved at a camp of like 40. But we had camps of 100. And if one person got saved, that's monumental. And they would say they got 40 kids got saved. Well, you know what? In 20 years in Czech Republic, I never had one person saved at a camp. And we preach the gospel every way you can imagine, chronologically, thematically, Christ every night, in every way you can imagine. It's an atheist country, and so uh, a lot of times people hear gospel, the gospel for the, for the first time. And so, uh, unfortunately, a lot of people, including I've had a cousin, I've had a best friend in high school, and many people uh, profess to receive Christ. You know, I'm convinced they're not born again. They haven't been in the church in 30 years. They curse. They live like the devil on drugs and alcohol. But because they raised their hand, because they prayed a prayer, they went down an aisle, they think they're saved. Well, the Bible says that when we're saved, we have a new heart. We're a new creation. And we live differently. And so we don't want to confuse evangelism with the results of our evangelism. No, like I said, no problem inviting people to come. We back on Sunday. We tell Pastor. I said on Sunday, Pastor Jim's here. If you have a need, if you want to know Christ, we'd love to talk to you. We'd love to pray with you. But we don't try to strong arm or manipulate people and, and work their emotions. And in fact, I, today I was reading, and I came across a story by Martin Lloyd Jones. He was a famous British preacher from the last century. And Lloyd Jones, in his book on preachers and preaching. He gives this testimony about how he was preaching on a Sunday night, and then after the uh, sermon, or after the sermon, he did not give uh, like a public altar call. And so the next morning, he ran into this young man in town, and uh, he said, "You know, doctor," he said, "if you had asked me last night to stay behind, in other words, to come down down the aisle," he said, "I would have done so." He said, "But you didn't." And Lloyd Jones, it's his testimony in his own book. And he said, uh, well, I'm asking you now. Come come with me now. And he says, oh, no. He says, but if you would have asked me last night, I would have come. And Lloyd Jones, in his book, he says, he replied and says, my dear friend, if what happened to you last night does not last for 24 hours, I am not interested in it. If you're not as ready to come with me now as you were last night, you have not got the right thing, the, the true thing. In other words, you didn't understand he said, whatever affected you last night was only temporary and passing. Still, you still do, do not see your real need for Christ. And so, Lloyd Jones points out that, you know, that something stirred this man the night before, but his heart wasn't stirred the next morning. And if, and if the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and you see your need for Christ, um, and you, and, and you don't repent, and, or if you go to bed, you will wake up the next morning feeling like there's a spear in your heart. Why? Because you recognize you need Christ. 
Until you come to the moment in your life where you don't want anything but Christ, you don't want to live another day without Christ, then, then you're not going to repent. You're not going to pray. So this man obviously wasn't to that point. He didn't see his need for Christ. He didn't come to the point in his life where he realized, you know what, I don't want to live another day without Christ. If he did, the next morning he would have been absolutely miserable until he found the preacher or called out to God for salvation. And so when we preach the gospel, we want to, as Paul, Paul said, we want to persuade people to, to trust Christ. We want to plead with them, be reconciled to God. What Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, that we plead with people to be reconciled to the Holy God. But we don't try to emotionally manipulate them. We let the, the Holy Spirit do his convicting work in their heart. And so when we think about evangelism, yes, we preach for a conversion. We want to see them know Christ. But it's not just some intellectual or some emotional experience. It's a heart change where God grabs a hold of your heart. And you, and you don't want to let go of Christ. So let's not confuse evangelism with the results of our evangelism. Hopefully we're going to have a lot of results from our evangelism. That's our goal. I mean, who, who, who preaches the gospel and says, well, I don't really care if people get saved. And we'd be fools if that our, was our attitude. Another thing evangelism is, is not is not just winning an argument. I've been in many debates over the years with atheists, and sometimes it was, I must say, it was pretty entertaining. It's kind of fun. Um, because you, you, especially where we were, because you're in, you're talking with people who had never even heard the word Christ other than uses a swear word, and and to and to present the gospel to them, to tell them of who Christ is, and they're like, I've never, I, I, I can remember, I can picture this young man right now. He goes, I've never heard this before. I've never had anybody tell me this before. And it's uh, it's it's stirring. It stirs your heart and. But it's so encouraging to see how they're just, wow, I mean, I've never heard I've never heard that there was a Savior. Never heard that anybody would die for me. Um, we pray that those people get saved. You know, maybe we planted a seed that night. But I can remember discussing one time, uh, we, I think the message on that night was the truth. Uh, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And so we're talking about truth. And then this uh, young girl discussion group. She was studying to be an attorney and she was trying to use her you know, her attorney skills or whatever they teach in the lawyer school, law school. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're taught a postmodern worldview there, which is that, you know, nothing is certain. And so she was telling me, you can't be certain that there is a God. I said, well, you can't be certain there's not a God. I said, God might have a little house on the other side of the moon and you just haven't been there to see it. You know, you haven't, you're not omnipresent. But God has revealed himself in creation, in our heart and mind, in our conscience. And I tried to show the gospel to her. She said, you can't be certain about these things. There's no, you know, there's no certainty in, in, in this world. And I said, well, you've just proved that there's at least one thing in this universe that we can be certain about. She said, what's that? I said, that you can be uncertain. <laughs> or you can't be certain. So, so you can be certain that you can't be certain. So there is certainty in this world. So <laughs> she goes, well, you got me. <laughs> but my goal was not to win the argument. My goal was not to, like, gotcha. You know, our goal is to is to present Christ to them. Our goal is for them to see Jesus high and lift it up. Because that's when he says he draws all men to him. And so that's what we want to preach, Christ high and lift it up. We, our goal is for her to embrace Christ, not to embrace our argumentation or our logic. A lot of times we, when we get engaged in apologetics, we can, you know, it's about winning an argument. But that's not what evangelism is about. We're not trying to outsmart unbelievers. Because you can't. I mean, you might be able to outsmart a few people with argumentation, but that's not our approach. Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians 2, and I look at the first few verses of 1 Corinthians 2, we'll talk about the rest of these verses later, but in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I have determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and much trembling. 
and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So here Paul is saying, look, I, I didn't come to you Greeks or, yeah, you Gentiles with all this persuasive speech and rhetoric, which, you know, the Greeks love. They love the, the to show their wisdom and their skill and, and rhetoric and communication. Uh, he said he came with one purpose in mind, and that was to declare Jesus Christ and him crucified. He wasn't coming as a salesman. He was coming as an ambassador to deliver the message of the king that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. He came to represent Jesus Christ and proclaim his message. Paul knew that great intellect and great speeches and crafty arguments won't save anybody. If people could get saved because we have the best arguments, then, then we don't have a whole lot of hope because you never know when you're going to come up against somebody who's going to have a better argument. Than you. We ultimately receive the gospel by faith. Was it, wasn't it... Um, Augustine, who said, I don't understand in order to believe, I believe in order to understand. Once you believe and your eyes are open to the glory of Christ and, and, and the truth of the Word of God, then it makes sense. Then you understand. But I, I had a lot of conversations with atheists and like, well, I need to study more. You know, they were looking for that moment of, of, of intellectual understanding. And if the gospel will make perfect sense to me and I can. And I can answer it with my humanistic reasoning, then I will believe. And I said, no, you're never going to understand the gospel that way. You have, to, you have to believe. And then your eyes will be open and you will understand. So we don't seek to win arguments. We seek to present Jesus Christ. Our goal is not to show how intellectual we are or how crafty we are in our argumentation but to please Christ by proclaiming the mysteries of salvation that are found in Jesus Christ. So you ask, well then, what is evangelism? Well, that's my second point, but I don't think I'm going to finish my whole second point tonight. <laughs> so we may probably continue in two weeks, because next week we've got our children's program. But first of all, let's, I'm going to read a couple definitions of evangelism, which I think are pretty good. The first one... <coughs> The guy's name is kind of cheesy. His name is John Cheeseman. But, uh, <laughs> but he has a good definition of, uh, of evangelism. He said, evangelism is not persuading people to make a decision. It is not proving that God exists or making out a good case for the truth of Christianity. It is not inviting someone to a meeting. It is not exposing the contemporary dilemma or arousing interest in Christianity. Is not wearing a badge saying Jesus saves. Some of these things might be right and good in their place, but none of them should be confused with evangelism. To evangelize is to declare on the authority of God that He has done what what He has done to save sinners, to warn men of their lost condition, to direct them to repent, and to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's a pretty good definition. And then I was reading uh, that the last same, or I don't know how to say this word, it uh, took place in Switzerland in, in 1974. There was, a, there was a conference on evangelism, and this is their definition. It says, to evangelize is to spread the good news that Jesus Christ died for our sins and was raised from the dead according to the scriptures, and that as the reigning Lord he now offers the forgiveness of sins and the liberating gift of the Spirit to all who repent and believe. That's a great definition. In simple terms, we could say evangelism is doing the work of an evangelist, right? It's preaching the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's what the evangelist in the Bible did. That's what Philip the evangelist did. He preached the person and work of Jesus Christ. Paul. 1 Corinthians 2, 2, I just read it. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul didn't care about the wisdom of the world. He intentionally chose to exclude everything except Jesus Christ and him crucified. For him, the, the object, objective and 
engaging these people in conversation and discussion at the Agora and at the synagogue was to tell them of Christ. That is evangelism. Evangelism is telling the message of Jesus Christ. It's that simple. So all these other things that, that people confuse evangelism with, you know, it's like they're adding to evangelism or, uh, to, to try to reach people. But our objective is to proclaim the message, and God does the work of salvation. You and I can't save anybody. My, my grandmother, I'm pretty convinced she died without Christ. I preached the gospel in every way humanly possible to my grandma. Chris just gave me a wonderful book a short while ago um, by Living Waters Ministries. And they have a great um, they have a great video called The Ten Canons of God's Law. Because my, my grandparents were raised Methodists. And so they didn't grow up, at least where they're from, the church she grew up in, they, she obviously didn't hear a clear gospel message. Because they used to say, oh, well, you, have to believe, you have to obey the Ten Commandments. And I call them Granny and Papa. I said, Granny and Papa, I said, but nobody can obey the Ten Commandments. Nobody can keep the Ten Commandments. So when I came across this video, I thought, I'm going to show them this video. It shows them how the Ten Commandments cannot save you, and how you cannot keep the Ten Commandments. When the video was over, it was like, whoosh, whoosh, over their head and under their feet. It's like, how could you not understand that? It was like, Clearest presentation ever. Why? Because God has to open their eyes, as He did Lydia. He has to open their hearts. He has to remove the veil, so we can preach. We can say, "Here's a lady in our church right before we left Czech Republic. I can't even count how many times I shared the gospel. She's a Catholic lady. She she would always come up to me and say, "I want to be like you. I want to believe like you do. But I'm trying to understand. I'm trying to be good." I said, "Stop. You're never going to be good enough." You have to trust Jesus. It's not by faith, by works. But she couldn't divorce her Catholic teaching or upbringing from the gospel. And so we plead with people to trust Christ, to repent and believe the gospel. That's what Jesus said in the beginning of Mark's gospel, that unbelievers must repent and believe the gospel. Our creed as Christians is simple. It's Jesus Christ. Spurgeon said, speaking of the gospel, he said, this is the sum, my brethren, preach Christ always and evermore. He is the whole gospel. His person, offices, and work, what must be our one great all comprehensive theme. That's our message. Paul said the same in Colossians chapter 1, verse 28, when he's describing his own personal ministry, he says, him we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. His message was Jesus Christ. So that is evangelism, proclaiming <coughs> the message of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and so we present his glorious work to redeem sinners, and we call people to repent and to trust him as Lord and Savior. When people reject you, when you're trying to share the gospel with them, when uh, they reject your message. They're not rejecting you. They're not even rejecting your message. They're rejecting Christ. Why do I say that? Because our message is all about Him. It's all about what He's done to save sinners. It's all about what He did to save me. What all He's done to save them. And so we preach the gospel to people, pleading with them to embrace Christ and to be reconciled to a holy God who will not overlook sin. And that is the purpose of evangelism. To present Jesus Christ to lost sinners. <clears throat> you can write this down. Our purpose is to preach the perfect life of Christ, His atoning death, and His glorious resurrection, which is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. That's our purpose. That is evangelism. Everything else is icing on the cake. But that is the heart and soul of what we do as evangelists. We preach a, the perfect life of Christ who came and he perfectly fulfilled the law of God that you and I could never do. The Bible says if we uh, stumble in one point of the law, we, we've broken it all. And so we preach the perfect life of Christ, which made it possible for him to die as the perfect sacrifice, the perfect toning sacrifice for sin. And his glorious resurrection is proof that God the Father accepted 
his payment. It was, it was, ver it was a verification of, of the Father accepting his sacrifice for our sin, that the price has been paid in full by raising him from the grave. And that's the message of, God, of salvation that we preach. And, and it's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. Amen. So that's why we evangelize. So people will believe. Not just in an intellectual way. It's not about winning arguments. We're not, our goal is not to get them to raise their hand or to walk an aisle, but to have a transformed heart. Amen. That's, that's what God does. But he only does it through the preaching of the gospel. We want them to know Jesus Christ personally as Lord and Savior. And we'll talk about all the details of all that next time. Well, let's close in prayer. Father, just thank you for our time together tonight. Lord, uh, there's probably a lot more things that we say with the gospel is not. There's a lot of things that people do that they equate with evangelism. But evangelism is very simple. As we just saw in your word, Lord, it's, it's, the, it's preaching Christ. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's our message. And Lord, may we not be shy in telling people about You. May we not be timid in letting people know our true identity, which we identify, not as transgender or not as anything in this world, but we identify as followers of Jesus Christ and Him alone. We don't find our identity in our job, we don't find our identity in our titles or in our degrees. We don't find our identity, uh, identity in our accomplishments or how, mu how much wealth or uh, poverty we have. God, we don't uh, find our identity in our skills or how successful we are in our work or, or whatever, God. We find our identity in Jesus Christ and in one. That we have been bought with the blood of Christ. We've been changed by the blood of the Lamb. Have been our sins have been washed away. And Lord, now we stand not in our works, but in the works of Christ. We stand in your grace by which you saved us. Not in our works, not by anything that we've done, not by our own goodness, but solely in the work of Christ. And Lord, I just pray that as we think about evangelism, that we realize the, the high priority that, must, that it must be in our lives. Because we have an amazing message to tell the world. And Lord, may we not forget the purpose of our mission, the purpose of evangelism, is to tell people of Jesus Christ so that they may know him and become disciples of him. And Lord, the first step to making disciples is to preach the gospel. And I pray that your spirit would work in our hearts and give us a boldness. Uh, it only comes from you. It only comes by having a fear of God. And I pray that you just fill our hearts with that boldness and that courage and confidence, Lord, to tell others of Jesus so that they may be saved and know you and worship you with us. And I pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Does anybody have any questions? Anybody have any questions? Maybe I said something that you're not sure about or I wasn't clear. So you mean we're supposed to do more than invite him to church? <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> well, I won't say that. Absolutely. That was a great mission. I appreciate that. Yes. All right. over there in There's watermelon. Watermelon, ice cream. And ice cream. And tomatoes.